And uh, without further ado, uh, we are really excited to have um, uh, four amazing panelists here today. Um, and instead of introducing them, I would actually um, be really happy if they could introduce themselves. I'm going to uh, call upon them one by one. It'd be nice if you could briefly share where are you calling us from and how are you doing today? Um, uh, Esteban, do you want to start? Sure, thank you, Elias. Can you all see me and hear me okay? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to be with you. Uh, my name is Esteban. I come from Argentina, but I'm currently based in Berlin, Germany. I've had to leave my country for fighting Shell and many other multinationals at the front lines of fracking in the area of Vaca Muerta, which is the name of the second largest shale gas basin in the world, and also the fourth largest shale oil basin. And Shell, like many other European multinationals, including French Total, uh, British BP, German Wintersaal, uh, Norwegian Equinor, and many others, are doing things in my homeland that are banned here in Europe, such as fracking, something so criminal that is totally indefensible, and yet they outsource it, they export it to us, and they bring back the products of this destruction to you in the form of oil and especially gas. Uh, gas. Thanks, that... thanks uh, Esteban. We, we were going to do a really brief round and ah, then we're going to go you. to more of the Sorry, I thought we were doing five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> stuff later. Um, so good to see you. Um, next up is uh, Tara. Um, how are you doing, Tara? Uh, thanks so much. I echo Esteban's. Uh, thank you for bringing everyone together. My name is Tara Carey. I'm uh, based in South London in Lambeth, which is actually the where the headquarters of Shell are based as well. And that's actually how I first got involved because I'm part of Extinction Rebellion um, and some local people from XR Lambeth were doing a protest outside Shell's headquarters. So they asked me to come along, um, which I did. And then they asked me to uh, start running Shell's Lives Twitter feed, which I did. And that's basically how I've kind of become more involved in the uh, campaign to end fossil fuels. And, and the more I've done it, the more horrified I have become at the exploits of companies like Shell and other big multinationals. Um, so I'm really excited to be here and I'm really interested uh, to hear what other people have to say. So thank you. Great to have you. Uh, next up is Friday. Can you hear me, Friday? Yes, I can hear you. How are you thank doing, you. Friday? Uh, I, uh, I am Friday Bani from uh, Nigeria. Sorry, from Mogoni. Yeah. Uh, as I'm speaking to you, is soups. Soups, we call it blood soups. It's in one tiny, tiny but, uh, particulate matter in the atmosphere. And it's becoming um, an endemic in the area. The result of uh, all combustion atmosphere. I'm happy to be here, so excited for the country and to learn from all of you. I'm so happy to be here. I uh, will we talk to each other. Thank you. Great to have you, Freddy. Um, and uh, next up is uh, Pei Chi from Singapore. Um, Hi. Hi, everyone. We're glad to be here as well. Um, Singapore Climate Rally, or SG Climate Rally, um, began as a group of concerned individuals who wanted to call attention to the structural nature of the ecological chaos that we're facing now. So we're a group of people who organized our first physical public demonstration um, in Singapore in September 2019 uh, to call on our government to acknowledge the root causes of climate change and to address them. So um, the conversation was very much focused on individual action up to this point. Um, and ironically, on the day that we had our rally in 2019, it was also um, the Grand Prix in Singapore. So while we were calling for action on climate change, we could hear the engines of the racing cars in the background. 
Um, um, so I think, you know, we've, we've done quite a bit of work uh, since then, but also it's been very challenging because the pandemic hit uh, not long after that. Um, so I'm actually currently, um, although I'm from Singapore, I'm currently um, based in London. I'm a master's student at Goldsmiths, um, so based in the southeast, not very far from Tara. Nice to meet you all. Great. Good to have you. Uh, I'm just going to check. Uh, Terence, are you here? All right. Terence from Ireland might have some time um, time zone issues, <laughs> which uh, was expectable. I'm so glad that you all made it. It's um, it's uh, it's not easy to get people together internationally within all these different time zones. Um, so yeah, some of you already talked a little bit uh, about your experiences with Shell, and maybe that's a good place to start. Um, I mean, we're here in a conference um, about Shell, and Shell uh, is um, a multi multinational colonial corporation. It started as the merger of uh, the Dutch um, oil uh, industry in Indonesia and a British oil trader in the region. Uh, that, that was the merger that was at the core of a Royal Dutch Shell more than 100 years ago. And so it's always been relying on these colonial uh, extractive systems um, to um, make its profits. Um, and that means that a lot of people around the world have made um, experiences with Shell in different ways. Shell is active in a lot of different regions. And uh, it'd be very uh, interesting, I think, to hear from all of you how, uh, what role Shell has played in, in, your, in your own country's communities. Um, and yeah, and, and um, you know, if you want to share a little bit about how that has also impacted your own work. Um, yeah, let's, let's do this one in the same order. Um, Esteban, you had already started speaking about that a little bit. Um, feel free to continue. Sure, sure. Uh, but it seems like I'm confused about the timing and I don't want to run over time. So how much time do I got now? All right. Uh, five minutes approximately okay, gotcha. would be great. Gotcha. That's what I if thought you I speak had for too long, I will oh. shut you up. But. Yeah, please shut, <laughs> shut me up. Yeah, no problem. Um, so, but what I was saying is that uh, it's, it's extremely exciting to be part of this conversation because uh, Shell Must Fall has been my inspiration since I came to Europe a couple of years ago after I had to flee the persecution and death threats that were happening in my home country. Uh, we built a, a massive anti-fracking movement when we leaked a secret document uh, revealing contamination of the water tables by fracking. And we faced what everyone in the global south more or less has to face, persecution, death threats, people were jailed, many other people had to go into exile to other provinces. And there was a lot at stake because we're talking about the world's second largest shale gas basin, a major source of fossil fuels, um, only second to China in terms of uh, unconventional reservoirs. And there's a lot at stake there. The US is even building a military base there to secure those resources for themselves. That's how much uh, we, were, we were jeopardizing and threatening with this mass uh, movement that we built. And then when I came to Europe a little more than two years ago, almost three years now, and, and I found out about Shell Must Fall, I also found at the same time that the climate movement in Europe is quite at a, at a really early baby step kind of thing, where there's a lot of abstract demands like tell the truth, five or 1.5. These are all demands that nobody could disagree with, of course. The problem is that being that they are not concrete, they are not tangible. We are not enforcing, we are not pushing any politician to take any actual action. The demand is so big that you're asking for all is the same as asking for nothing. But asking for Shell to fall, asking for Shell to stop fracking Argentina or stop the tar sands operations in uh, native lands in Canada, or any other of the other crimes that they're committing worldwide is a lot more real. And I think the climate movement is about time for it to get real. It's about time for it to tackle the elephant in the room of the climate crisis, which is Shell, BP, Total, and the multinational, top multinational fossil fuel companies, which 100 of them, as you may know, are responsible for more than 70% of all global emissions 
So you go to COP, you go to the governments to demand things, and it's all about governments cutting emissions. No one is mentioning corporations. The media are owned and sponsored by them. The politicians are owned and sponsored and their, their campaigns are financed by them. Nobody, even NGOs, even there's many good NGOs, but they cannot really tackle these companies directly or they will be flooded with lawsuits and it's like fighting David and Goliath. Who, what NGO can really put up multiple lawsuits against Shell or BP or Total? So it really falls down to us, the grassroots. And that's why Shell must fall is so powerful. And that's why when you share with me last year uh, the leaflets that you were making, the manuals for activists, so my, my feedback to you was that this is a blueprint for system change. Everyone is saying how we must fight capitalism, system change, no climate change. Yes, by how, but how? And I don't seem to see any clear path forward. Everything is just a slogan, but Shell Must Fall is a way where people can begin to take power in their own hands to dismantle the worst uh, uh, symbols of the capitalist system that we need to change by bringing down one climate criminal at a time. And if we do that, and if we succeed, then we can build the momentum and the power that we need to bring down the other climate criminals like Total and BP and so on. But we will not bring Shell down all at once. I think we also really need to give ourselves a very honest debate to recognize that as a climate movement, we are failing, have the humility to come together between Global South and North as we've been doing and uh, really discuss strategy. We won't bring down Shell all at once, but we might win Shell smaller victories, like bring them out of the tar sands, get them out of Vaca Muerta, where what they're doing is so undeniably wrong and so indefensible that we have all the arguments, the science and the political framework in Europe on our side. If we could galvanize that and bring together XR, Endegale, the Fridays for Future and all the other groups, for the global south and for international solidarity for their own survival i think that's the path forward and i don't want to run over the five minutes i don't know how much time i have now but i'm going to end it there just to add that i have been pushing for this across europe and we build campaigns inspired by shell must fall like shale must fall we built a global platform of international solidarity as a play on words with gas with shale you know so uh shale and shell are they rhyme so with it shale must fall brought together more than 20 countries, grassroots groups, and did a lot of actions against fracking, gas, colonialism. And I've also been pushing for campaigns such as Total Must Fall, uh, Wintersal Must Fall in Germany, where I am. Nobody knew about Wintersal, their biggest oil and gas company. Equinor Must Fall, we did it in Norway. And I think we should all, um, uh, inspired by Shell Must Fall, multiply this initiative and really try to take all the attention and power of the climate movement to the next stage, which is to tackle the real players in the climate crisis that are these fossil fuel companies. Thank you, Simon. That's great. And it is also great to see, I think in the audience, we also have some people from Stop Adani. Um, I just saw in the welcoming, I think there's also um, BP or not BP, so there are already um, a, a couple of these campaigns also represented here today, which is really great. Um, uh, next up is Tara. Tara, you're not only based in, uh, in London, near to the new Shell headquarters, but you're also running a very cool Twitter account where you're documenting um, Shell's, uh, Shell's activities all over the globe. So yeah, yeah how, how, how did you end up doing that? Yeah, so um, I, in my day job, work for an international women's rights organization. I'm their head of media and I do advocacy and media communications. Um, and so what I've done is I've used the skills that I have in my day job and applied them to my climate campaigning. And I think one of the things that is really important is everyone can, you know, everyone brings their own skills. They have their own networks. They have their own contacts. And I think part of what's really important in climate campaigning is to apply those, whatever they may be. So for me, um, as I said, I've, I was first uh, got involved in climate campaigning through Extinction Rebellion, um, and that's been a really amazing experience. And I've been really well networked with lots of different campaigners focusing on different types of things. Um, and I feel like I've learned a lot through that. Um, and uh, one of the people that I know through my local XR group, as I said, had sort of uh, was involved in the campaign against Shell. And uh, they were planning an action where they went down to, uh, so Shell's headquarters, for those of you who don't know, it's right on the Thames, and it's diagonally opposite um, the Houses of Parliament. 
and there's Westminster Bridge that goes across it. So some activists came along and they uh, put massive banner across Westminster Bridge saying shell equals death. Um, and they invited the media down and we covered it on social media and we took photographs and all the sort of, you know, that kind of direct action stuff that helps to then provide visual content and acts as a kind of, uh, as a gateway to talk about some of these different issues. So off the back of that, the Shells Lies Twitter feed was, uh, was set up. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea of it is to act as a kind of a news feed for people. Um, and also as a way of a kind of connecting and networking. So one of the things that I think is really important, um, and you know, today is a really great example of that, is about kind of global networking with activists. Um, in my day job, um, I work a lot with people in the global south, um, and one of my real passions in terms of the activism idea around fossil fuels is to amplify the voices of people in the global south and also to kind of build bridges and network between those in the global south and um, activists in places like the UK across Europe. So uh, one thing that's been really effective is there's a, a WhatsApp group where quite a few people I'm sure maybe who are attending this session today are also on this WhatsApp group and it focuses specifically on fossil fuels. So we will um, you know, share information, breaking stories, um, I'll tweet stuff you know, and post there, then that helps with the amplification. Um, we've also done something where we've set up a direct message group on Twitter with activists across the global south where we also share information, opportunities and where we retweet each other's stuff. So I think part of what uh, effective campaigning about is, is forging those networks and creating those channels of communication. Um, and then I think that also enables us to kind of stay on the cutting edge of what's going on. So another thing that's been really um, effective recently is um, the campaign in South Africa around the uh, Shell's activities around um, surveying in the in the water so I'm guessing quite a lot of you know about that and again just using that as an example of um, successful networking where um, the Exclusion Rebellion Cape Town group and some other local activists um, you know when they first started talking about it you know it really wasn't getting international pickup um, and then through networking through um, sharing stories linking up with journalists and then through international activists you know highlighting this stuff it's ended up being a massive story and that's helped add put pressure on um, the South African government but also one of the things that's been effective around social media is they've been caused to boycott local petrol stations that use Shell um, then in England that we've got a campaign against the Science Museum and their, um, their corporate sponsorship with Shell so that's been another thing that we've been able to talk to, uh, you know, campaign around the Science Museum about what's going on in South Africa. So I think it's really important to be making those connections, looking again where big corporations are, are greenwashing um, and then finding out from people who are being affected directly by some of this stuff. So, for example, the stuff that Esteban was talking about in, um, you know, in Latin America and then funneling that stuff up and then using it as pressure points. Great, thanks so much. And I saw in the comments already one person <laughs> was asking you to sh share the WhatsApp group. Um, I will do. So uh, that'd be, I think, a good good place to start um, organizing together. Um, and and I also saw, I think, some people here from South Africa today, which is is really great. We were um, we were rooting for you, and we were also trying to contact some people. So maybe we can also. Um, you know, organize an event sometimes to hear more about your experiences, um, which would be really great. Um, also here is Friday um, from Ogoni Land. And uh, um, I think many of us know that Shell has been very active in that region as well. And that Shell has also been responsible for some really, really horrible crimes in the region. Um, yeah, Friday, do you want to share a little bit about the role of, of Shell um, in Nigeria and in Ogoni land specifically? Um, I don't know how your internet is. I think you had a little bit of connection issues before, so maybe it's better if you keep your camera off. But um, yeah, feel free to share and uh, yeah. All right. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this uh, great opportunity. Uh, like I say, I am Friday uh, from Nigeria. Uh, the share of a team is something that uh, we, 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 cannot, we, we cannot take a little look of it because of their impacts that she have created in Nigeria, especially in Ogoni and the Niger Delta. To date, 
Ogoni remain a, a wasteland, a disaster environment because of the uh, impact. Those people called share, they have, we have recorded about 1,000 P oil spill. So we are swimming in oil spill in the region. Since 2020, share have reported 1,010 P oil spill with about uh, 1,000 of some, some thousand of barriers of uh, oil that we live in the region. So we swim in the area. Citizens have been reporting. Organizations have also reported to. Uh, we keep complaining of their, their devastating impact of share, but we have found no solution because they collaborate. They work in hand with the, the federal government of Nigeria and because of the, the benefits the government of Nigeria is gaining from them, it makes it so, so difficult for us to stop the share and I resorted to so many crises. For example, uh, how much share is given to Nigeria? I saw some records. In 2029, 2009, about $5.63 billion was given to Nigeria's government from share. In 2018, about $6.39 billion was given to Nigeria from share. In 2020, in 2017, $4.32 billion was given to Nigeria government from share. Then in 20, 2016, $3.64 billion was given to Nigeria from share. Then in 2015, that 2015, $4.95 billion was given to Nigeria from share. So if this amount of money has been given to Nigeria government, it's indirect Nigeria government to keep silent when they are doing their operation. So that is an obvious evidence that they are working together to destroy the environment. And indirectly, anything that destroys the environment, they are destroying the life and the aquatic environment in that region. You can record with me that uh, in 1958, when Shea started gaining entrance into Ogori land, they started gaining entrance to Ogori land in 1958. That should be over 64 years today. And since then, they have started operation not until they collaborate with Nigeria government and uh, rise the uh, 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 violation of human rights in the region. Even when our forefathers, our fathers, our leaders came together and said, Share. We need to have an environmental impact assessment. Why you are working like this in our land? What are our benefits? What are we standing to gain? They keep promising scholarship, they're promising many things as employment, but behold, we see nothing. For over five decades now, Nigeria continues to experience a remarkable increase in operational activities in the share oil and gas exploration exploitation, and refinery product marketing. Now, the onshore activities center mainly in the Niger Delta area. And when we are talking about the Niger Delta, we are referring to the Ogori regions. These are generated a massive weight for the nation, for the share, and for the nation called Nigeria. It is a nationally acknowledged that the national blessing of this Niger Delta it's known for its difficult land to read of swamping the rain. And mangrove forests have contributed most to the social economic development of the entire country, Nigeria, especially in the areas of forest exchange. Any provision of job, opportunity, physical infrastructure, in education, in health, in communication, and in power. Behold. Thank you. If Thank you, Friday. That if you are coming from, you know I mean, if you are coming from short environment, if you were privileged to be in that kind of environment, where are you born? Um, at the end of the day, you see the way you born into as a, as a child, you born into a good way, and you are not even entitled. You already. Okay, Friday. Friday. To...
I'm just going to briefly. Freddy, you're having some connection issues. The weather. Yeah. I will just um, uh, environmental delegation from share. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, also, I think your five minutes are almost, uh, I'm almost gone. <laughs> so maybe. <laughs> I, think, I think I still have one minute remaining. <laughs> All right. I think I'll, I still have one minute. Okay. Yeah, we, can, we will have another round. Um, but uh, thanks so much for sharing. And we'll pass it then on to the next speaker. But also, um, for everyone, Friday has a, a really great NGO working in the Niger Delta uh, called the Lekke Development Foundation. And uh, yeah, we've been working together with Shamus Frol for a while. Um, thank you, Friday. Um, if it's OK, I'll, I'll pass on um, to the next uh, speaker, uh, Pechi. Um, and many people don't know, but uh, Singapore is also home to one of the largest shell refineries. So, um, and other companies as well. So it'd be very interesting to hear about how climate justice organizing works in Singapore. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you, Elias. So I think, I think the most important thing to understand is that there's a very close relationship between the state um, and the industry in, in Singapore. Um, I mean, the state is generally very business friendly anyway, but there's a special place for the fossil fuels industry because they were one of the first groups of multinational companies who invested in Singapore shortly after it became an independent sovereign state in 1965. So Shell actually started in 1960 with a $30 million investment, which was, you know, in those days, you can imagine that was the biggest investment we had at the time. Um, and since then, the state has spent a lot of public resources um, on backing the industry, you know, creating a whole new island just to um, allow firms to set up very conveniently, financial investments to encourage investment, as well as training a very disciplined workforce that keeps the whole thing running. Um, and I think, um, you know, just, just to go back to your point about saying how Shell is a colonial company and also how, um, you know, do we, do we pitch our demands at governments or corporations? Um, it really is both because in the, the modern neo-colonial, neoliberal economy, the, the state and the co uh, companies are very much enmeshed together. The state exists to basically discipline labor and, and the population in service of uh, accumulation of capital, right? So um, I think it's very important to understand that um, the, the, the role of critiquing um, the state uh, and its policies and practice, practices in terms of uh, creating those conditions for uh, capitalist firms to continue doing these um, destructive practices is, is very important. And one, one good example um, is that um, actually in 20, 2014, our Prime Minister was a guest of honour at the opening of uh, ExxonMobil plant. And you know this was the 120th year uh, anniversary of Exxon being in Singapore. And he called this a special kind of wedding anniversary. And he even said um, that you know the government will basically um, do whatever it can to, to back the oil companies and, and help them to keep running. So, I mean, of course, this is in 2014, um, but even then, you know, there was definitely already an awareness um, of, of climate change and its, its impacts. Um, but you, 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 that's where you start to see this contradictory stance of not denying climate change, but also strongly supporting the fossil fuels industry because, um, you know, there, there's still this uh, reliance on the development versus environment trade-off. Um, and I think that's as activists, that is really um, something that is something where we have to really um, to, to bring down this, this uh, the framing of this trade off, which is really completely false. Um, and, and it's not only ExxonMobil, you know, it's very common for uh, uh, ministers and government representatives to be present at uh, events that all companies host. And even recently, you, you start seeing that the message starts to change. It starts to go towards more of oh, the role that all companies uh, can play in being sustainable. So there was a 2019 event held by Shell called Powering Progress Together, um, which um, the senior minister was a guest at. And he acknowledged, again, climate change in his first sentence, but also uncritically congratulated Shell on the significant measures it was taking uh, to reduce its carbon footprint, which we know is a wholly unscientific way of going about things. And it's basically, you know, just PR at this point. Um, so, you know, in terms of what we, we do as activists, I, I really see that the conversation has to operate on multiple levels. So at the very top level, of course, there's this um, idea of shifting the overturn window, which is, you know, saying quite radical or, or shocking things to 
to, to kind of like get people to think, even if there's a lot of objection to, to the idea. So at our 2019 um, public event, we had a young speaker, um, you know, who, uh, Ho Xiang Tian, who really caused a stir when he said, it makes no sense to me that we are told to switch off our lights when not in use, but the lights um, on Jurong Island, you know, which is this island where all the, the oil companies are based, the lights on Jurong Island never seem to be switched off. And, you know, he got so much pushback on that. Um, but, you know, that that really is, he has been vindicated by all the, the, the events that have happened since um, 2019. Um, at the same time, um, you know, all companies play a very strong PR game, especially in advertising, um, in the education sector. So we have Shell uh, sponsoring academic prizes um, in more than one of our major universities. Um, they actually sponsor the dissertation prize for the environmental management masters um, at the National University. So, and they're not the only all company to, to, to do such sponsorship. Um, they advertise professional opportunities, um, which continues to feed this pipeline of people who, who run the industry. They have a very visible presence. You know, they sponsor concerts and exhibitions, uh, ironically, including one on endangered species and conservation targeted at young school children. So, you know, it's, it's very important for us to basically critique, um, create that space for critique, um, to create this critique of capitalist neoliberal development models to basically interrupt the social license that, um, you know, all these companies have. So, um, you know, uh, and also to, to bring uh, the attention squarely back on the, the, the um, you know, the need for the companies to really um, we live up to the responsibilities in a just transition. So, so we actually realized that while um, all companies actually contributed 45% to our carbon emissions in Singapore, but despite that, Shell only paid $49 million in taxes despite generating $2.3 billion in profits just in Singapore alone, which is way below the 17% uh, corporate tax rate. So they're clearly getting a lot of um, tax incentives. So, um, you know, um, we recently hosted um, the General Secretary of the largest all workers union in Singapore at our 2021 post COP26 event. And he said that his biggest worry is whether our workers can adapt and change to new environments and reskill. And so, you know, I have definitely spoken with people who work in the industry who say that they are being kept in the dark as to what the company's plans are. Employees ask what they can do to contribute to sustainability. So at the workers level, there is this awareness and there is this desire not to do, uh, you know, not to participate in destructive actions, but there is really a lot of good answers. There, isn't, there aren't a lot of good avenues for them to figure out how to basically redirect the pathway of, of their careers. And my final point I would say is that, you know, it's very important to be cognizant of um, the role of, of, of the, the Norths and Souths within the global North and South. So as Singapore, it's a very rich country. Um, it's, its development pathway has resulted in it becoming a global hub for oil and gas trading as, as well as uh, processing. It's uh, also a global hub for finance. And I think um, we also want to call attention to the role of um, such cities in terms of um, accumulating and, and uh, accumulating the power and capital and also kind of like directing the global agenda that then results in the negative impacts that are directly felt in our neighboring countries in terms of all these energy infrastructure and projects as well as you know in places as far away as Argentina in, in Nigeria and so on South Africa um, all these things are connected and even though you know we technically um, Singapore considers itself a technically a, a developing country. It's, it's um, I think it's Annex 2. Um, but, you know, it does have a very strong role to play in terms of um, the, the power of, of um, these uh, global hubs in terms of uh, transporting, processing, refining, and financing all these destructive activities. So I will end on that note. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Feishi. That's great. And um, for those who don't know, I, Singapore Climate Rally has also been hosting these really, really cool events. Um, bringing together different movements from that region, uh, from Southeast Asia, um, bringing together movements from uh, Indonesia, um, Malaysia, the Philippines, India, and so on. Um, so yeah, if you haven't done so, check out their pages and um, support them as well. Um, and also here now with, with us, we have um, Terence Conway. Um, hi Terence, how are you doing? Um, you're still muted, but I'm going to say really briefly, Terence has been uh, one of the people involved uh, in a really, really remarkable campaign against Shell in Ireland a couple of years ago, where they managed to uh, delay a project for, I think, almost 10 years. Um, and 
uh, we're yeah, facing exactly. a really, really um, uh, crass resistance. I mean, really, really um, unimaginable, actually, like mercenaries hired and and shall bribed um, a lot of people as well. So yeah, maybe Terence, you can tell us more about that. Uh, well, just go back to the beginning of the campaign. The Corrib gas field, the Corrib gas field was discovered in uh, 1996. Uh, not a lot of people at the time thought it was going to be uh, make everyone millionaires, basically in the area. But uh, a few people look start looking into the issues, and uh, they started getting concerned. So gradually, uh, it went on then. Uh, in 2005, there was a, as part of the project, the pipeline, when it had come on land, it had uh, go across people's lands and they blocked that. So as a result, Shell took out a high court injunction to stop them from interfering uh, with the pipeline on, on the private property. Uh, so they spent 94 days in jail. As soon as they went to jail, the local people uh, shut down the refinery site, the building site, and kept it shut for uh, about 15 months or something like that. Uh, when the Rossport Five were in jail, there was an awful lot of coverage of the issues nationally and the media. So the state and Shell had a problem. How did they get around that? So after 94 days, the, the Rossport Five got out of jail. And uh, gradually then uh, the onslaught started against us. Uh, it started first in the media, uh, where it was noticeable, where the issues were being distorted gradually in the media. Uh, essentially, they made out that we were a wing of the IRA that somehow was never discovered. Uh, so in October 2006, then the state came in with a few hundred uh, police and started assaulting everyone, and they managed to get the refinery site opened. What's significant is uh, what the police did they came in with a no rest policy. And what that means is they were no longer acting as police. They were acting as thugs because a police man or woman without the power of arrest is lured to a simple thug. Uh, that continued on. Uh, and uh, Shell worked close with the police on the issues. Uh, we we had support from various uh, a few groups around the country. The Rossport Solidarity Camp uh, set up here in a field where people from around the country and around the world came to support us, including from Nigeria and South Africa, Durban, South Africa. Uh, there was a lot of other places as well. But uh, Shell and the state and the media in general operated as one. Uh, the various NGOs in the country were uh, basically a, a waste of space. The, Green, the Irish Green Party uh, initially were in support of us, but they went into government with uh, Fianna Fáil another political party, and they immediately uh, forgot about us and came out in support of the refinery. Uh, meanwhile, while all this was going on, the media continued. Everything possible that could be distorted was any incident that happened, they totally ignored the 
the actions of the police, the illegal actions, because the police and Shell, they actually operated as partners in crime. Uh, we have extensive video evidence to show that. Uh, but it's eventually you, Terrence, they got yeah. That's already uh, five minutes as well, but... Um, oh, is it okay? If you want to wrap up, uh, you feel free to say one, two yeah. more sentences. Eventually they got the refinery operational at the end of uh, 2015, where the refinery almost blew up when they switched it on. Uh, at present, uh, it's operating away and uh, the state, yeah, the state handed over uh, with great uh, tax breaks, all the resources to the oil companies or whoever wants them. Thank you. That's, uh, and I think it's interesting how we see some of the same patterns in different countries where Shell comes in and, and um, works to collude on different levels with the state. I think that's a theme that we've heard throughout the different uh, contributions, the role of bribery. Um, and the role of, I mean, more obviously, like the police and, and the different arms of the state. Um, but also, I think the role of international solidarity, right, which we've also, you know, heard in, in all of the different contributions. So um, I'm really curious to think more forward to how we can, you know, take these experiences and um, make it our new year's resolution to build more international solidarity against shell and the fossil fuel industry i have to say we're a little bit uh over time like we're a little bit slower than expected but i think that's usually the case so i just already want to invite um folks uh, in the audience because i know we have a lot of people from different places here who probably also have interesting questions or stuff to say um, and we're going to do it this way, I think, um, because it's very hard to, for me to keep track of people raising their hands and so on. But if you have a question, um, how about you just um, you just text a star or um, into the uh, into the into the chat box? I'm going to do it. Uh, I'm going to do an example, um, and then I can call on you. Uh, in, in the order in which the stars were posted and then you can pose your questions. If it's something really, really urgent, you can also put uh, two stars. Um, and while you uh, post your stars, uh, Esteban has something to add. So let's first, first Esteban, uh, maybe make your point and then we can start taking questions. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, Elias. So regarding international solidarity, like we've been hearing, is super important for moving forward in the climate fight. And it's not just about, in the case of the global north, helping or much less saving the global south. You are killing us. Your companies are destroying the planet in a continuation of colonialism of past centuries, which Elias opened the conversation explaining about Shell. The others are just the same. They are a branch of today's colonialism at the expense of sacrificing communities at the front lines of the global south for the last drop of gas and oil and mining and beyond. So um, uh, the global south also has a lot to offer to you in the global north. I feel the global north is lost. I feel Europe is Eurocentric, egocentric, trapped in a bubble of bullshit where they're just looking at themselves in the mirror, seeing how great they are, how, how great demos they mobilize. But allow me to be frank, we need to have a frank and humble discussion of what's really happening. We are losing the climate fight and the possibilities are skipping through our finger to keep below 1.5 and much less to reigning any other kind of um, global warming and destruction. So the international solidarity is what can save us. You know, Chomsky has written a book called Internationalism or Extinction. And it's something along those lines. If you, if you remain in bubbles, just thinking how much the UK reducing its emission or Germany or Europe reducing its own emissions, it's more greenwashing, it's more green capitalism. What really needs to happen is that the global north connects with the people in the front lines of the global south and within the global north, because indigenous communities of, of Texas in the US and Canada are treated in the same way. They're like the global south within the global uh, north. 
violation of human rights, persecution and beyond. So to really connect the dots because shell operations of oil and gas, all the extraction is happening outside of here or the most devastating side of it, like the tar sands, the fracking, what I have mentioned before. So we can connect the dots, we can mobilize together in one day of action globally to really cast light to these activities and really start bringing them down, maybe picking where they are weakest and where we can be strongest. We need to give ourselves a strategic debate. So with shale must fall, we have begun doing these actions of international solidarity. And I think we all should really focus on shell to start then on the others to really bring them down globally, maybe pick a, a, a location and an activity that is so undeniably wrong and try to rally around that and focus our efforts, but also not locally, but internationally in the hopes that actually we can make some enough media impact to make a difference for their stock to fall, for their, uh, you know, for them to suffer a PR consequence and have to act upon that. Thank you, Esteban. I'm not seeing any stars yet. <laughs> so if there are no questions as of yet from the audience, um, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna ask around if anyone on the panel wants to reply to this, uh, what Esteban just said, um, feel free to unmute yourselves. Um, else Friday, you also wanted to say something before and I shut you up. So this would also be a chance to, uh, to react to what the other people said and, and continue your point. Okay, hello. Hi. Uh, I, I, I totally agree to the last speaker. And I, not only to have a deal of action, but uh, we also need to build a community solidarity movement in the grassroots, then ensure we have an international uh, deed of action. And, you know, it only is in solidarity and collaboration, will, partnership will be the secret to make sure share for flats in all the uh, country. As I'm speaking to you in Nigeria, share have started to sell some of their equipment. They want to move from the the, the land, they want to go to the offshore only with the information I gather. And they are beginning, not only share, but most of the oil company, they are aware that a uh, force has coming. So we continue to press the forces. If you continue to press the forces, much of them will change their policy and come back to enable energy. As I'm speaking to you in Nigeria once again, that was the point I wanted to add, there is pains there is enough records of human rights violation and there's torture ongoing in the area. We are not yet free to carry out protests or to carry out action without taking permission from government and security agencies. And these are uh, a switch remitting our rights as a citizen, as a human in uh, this part of the world. So it is only in synergy, in collaboration that we can add and make sure we come to and sure we get a justice for our environment. Now, I believe many parts of the country is now recording obvious signs of a, a climate change and, and blast suit. And with the report conducted by it is a research group from medical practitioner in one of the teaching hospitals in Nigeria, a very renowned hospital in Nigeria, doctor came together and conducted a research I can send that to you. They have come back with a research that uh, uh, young people, especially the May, have continued to have a, a malfunctional uh, spermatozoa. Spermat that is, is, is they, are, they, are, they are continuing to have the young people in Nigeria now, especially in the Niger Delta region, where the massive uh, oil exploitation and bunkering and illegal refinery is taking place day to day that the people, young men in that area have a abnormality in their sperm. They have abnormality in their sperm and that give rise to infertility in the region. I don't know, but this is the research work we gather from a medical practitioner. Uh, we can't keep silent of this issue. It is time we have to network with other uh, mindful organizations from other parts of the world and we we'll come together 
to declare a date of action, not even a day, but continually pushing the action, putting the action. The more we push the action, the more they know that we are saying our right, we are demanding for our right. Thank you. As other speaker, I want to say something. Thank you, Friday. And uh, I mean, the International Day of Action is, is definitely, I think, something that we'll, we'll take from here. I mean, we did have last year a little bit, we tried to have different actions on the day of the AGM. But of course, another question is if we want to make ourselves dependent so much on the calendar of Shell, or if we should determine our own calendar as a movement and choose our own issues. I think that's something that we have to discuss moving forward. So now there's, I think, a raised hand from Peggy. There's also a question from Sunny. So I'm first going to ask Peggy to make your point, and then we're getting to the first question from Sunny. Thank you. Um, I saw a comment from Kathy in the chat on mobilizing the working class, and um, I completely agree. Um, I think one one question for me and something that we're trying to work on is, you know, what exactly is what what exactly are people who work in these industries thinking? Um, I think a lot of times um, the reason why it's very difficult to to achieve that political will to basically phase out the fossil fuel industries is because there's this fear. I mean, especially in Singapore, where it's very much a export oriented developmental model um, that, you know, you, you just need to um, be nice to those companies that can give you whatever jobs you can get and, and don't ask too many questions about um, how ethical or how um, destructive they are to the environment. Um, so I think, um, but no, nobody actually wants to work uh, in a company that's destroying the environment. So um, I think, um, you know, that, that's something that we, we kind of like want to think about maybe mobilizing um, oil and gas workers. Um, it's, I don't have answers to the question of how to do that because um, we are still in the process of trying to build um, um, relationships um, and, and find out more about people's experience in, in the industry. But I do know um, there was a, a survey done um, in the UK of offshore platform workers and the overwhelming majority of them wanted to get out of the industry, wanted to do something else, um, you know, and, and we're not getting any support on it. Um, and at the same time, we also see that governments are now doing, like they're publishing all these like, oh, green plan, green ambition, and so on. And I mean, it's a lot of bullshit. Uh, just to, to put a very fine, uh, not too fine point on it, um, but also a lot of the solutions that are being proposed are what, you know, the Indigenous Environmental Network calls the false climate solution. So um, really things like nature-based solutions or carbon taxes. And we know that carbon taxes are a lot of times very unjust because um, they, they really penalize um, poor people rather than the rich companies that have profited from all these destructive activities. So, um, you know, that's potentially points uh, where we can create interventions. Um, and we did do something earlier uh, last year in 2021 around May Day, um, where we talked about how um, the petrol tax hike um, that the government put in place was actually not doing anything to help because we don't have uh, electric vehicle infrastructure in place yet. But increasing the petrol tax just ends up uh, penalizing um, all the, you know, all the, the private uh, higher uh, drivers and and really it really just ends up squeezing the workers more thank you yeah that's a that's always a, a, a very um interesting but a lot of organizing work to, to get together with workers in the industry i mean that's also something that we've talked about as she must fall and i know recently it came up that um there's, in brazil there's this this idea to to together with workers to campaign to turn the state-owned oil company Petrobras into Solarbras. So there's, um, there's different models about that. And I think that's also something really important that we think about, right? If Shell uh, gets dismantled, then of course, that doesn't mean that we want all the workers to get fired, but we want to ensure a just transition. And um, Well, how do we get the workers of Shell to fight? or fight with us for the abolition of Shell. That's, I think, something that's, um, that, that we continue, have to continually talk about. All right, um, we have two questions. Um, the first one is from Sunny. Sunny, if you're uh, free to uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you very much. I got the invitation through social media uh, because I'm in South Africa. I'm not sure how many uh, of the delegates know um, the recent victory that we had in South Africa against uh, uh, Shell's um, seismic survey. Uh, it was meant to have been a five-month program. They didn't uh, stay on the water for even 15 days because um, there was a lot of organizing from um, 
from communities uh, near the coast, activists like ourselves, but particularly this aspect of lawfare. So uh, in the courts, we want an interdict um, for them to, to move. So they are, we track the, the ship uh, Amazon Warrior daily. It's on its way now, uh, conflicting results, uh, of whether it's on its way to Argentina or whether it's on its way to Spain. It's uh, the, the app says uh, Las Palmas, but as you know, it's Spanish or Portuguese, so there'll be lots of different, uh, different interpretations and I'm tracking it, but it's in confusing waters at the moment of the West Coast of Africa. So it might be going north or it might be going we uh, uh, back west towards, um, towards Argentina. So, but we'll keep the group posted. So that was a victory. But I wanted to first of all thank Esteban for the solidarity with the Global South. As activists in the Global South, we, 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 we don't often see that, the Global North solidarity. It's very academic, it's very intellectual, uh, uh, but, but in practice, it's not there. So our voices uh, in the Global South is constantly to amplify that the Global South exists, it needs to be protected. We don't want to be dictated by the Global North, we want to work in solidarity. But here's my point that I wanted to make. So the fundamental to the just transition is this idea of workers' rights and, uh, and organizing amongst the unions. Now we have a dichotomy in South Africa. This recent Shell, Shell's partner in South Africa is an investment company that came out of the union movement. So they, they, they actually, their main, uh, 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 the target of our, of our campaign is going to move from Shell to its local partners. The local partners in South Africa are unionists. They came out of the union movement. They have some worker backing uh, originally. So, so the challenge is that it's not always um, evident that uh, the just transition or our campaign is pro-worker. So even when we, we the, the inland at the coast, you could, you, could, you, you, could, you could boycott directly against the ship, um, and make your, uh, go onto the coast and have, but in, inland uh, in South Africa, we decided to ta target the service stations. Now in South Africa, the Shell service stations are not owned by the Shell Corporation or Royal Dutch Shell or the new branded Shell that's going to the UK. It's, going, it, it's owned by private people. It's owned by private investors, private entrepreneurs, normal, normal, uh, normal business owners. And all of its workers uh, are normally low, low paid workers. So we were very, very conscious of not tramping on workers' rights, but showing solidarity. So even when we shut down the service stations for an hour or two, we made sure that there was some monetary collection that we did and that we gave that to the workers to compensate them for the loss uh, of any income or tips or, or, or gratuities that they would get while it was open. But uh, uh, my encouragement is in wherever the campaign starts in any part of the world, specifically in the global, in the global uh, south, is uh, it's sometimes too difficult to aim our, 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 our program at Shell, the corporation in Holland or in its new headquarters in the UK. But what is a much more achievable uh, 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 strategy is to look for the local partners. Now, in our case here, the local partners were not uh, uh, multinational corporations. The local partners were, were local people. There's a lot more market intelligence about local partners, but also to understand that sometimes your local partner can be somebody sitting around the table with you. So the, the local partner is the left, was a leftist unionist. So how you go from a leftist unionist protecting workers' rights seemingly uh, uh, protecting the environment to going to be an ultra capitalist. So we must also be careful about that. Oh, my question. My question is how do we, uh, do we make sure that in our waters, some of the comments was, hey, perfect campaign, you got a shell in your waters, but our campaign is a global campaign. It's a global climate justice campaign. So we can't celebrate the victory if the ship is on its way to Argentina to do seismic testing in Argentina. So how do we emphasize and amplify global solidarity on the ground? Thank you so much, Sunny, for the contribution. And I saw Esteban already posted something about protests against um, 
these kinds of activities in Argentina. So it'll probably be really interesting to, to link up. Um, and he also wants to say something. I, I was just briefly reminded, and I think many people do not know about this history, but um, there was already, I mean, Michelle was very much in bed with apartheid um, as well in South Africa, as I understand. And I know that in the 80s, I mean, also people in Europe perhaps were like, a little bit more radical, but uh, shell petrol stations were burned down, uh, not, not not only in South, Africa, but also in countries like Sweden and the Netherlands in solidarity with the anti-apartheid movement. So I think there are historical precedents uh, for more radical kinds of action that do exist. I and I think agree. it's on to us to, you know, make sure that history um, continues. Um, all right, um, I'll take uh, Esteban, you want to reply to this? And then we have okay. another question after that Thank um, you very briefly, from Daniela. I reply to Sunny, uh, brought all brotherhood and power to you. And this is really important what you just said, because right now in the last few days, people across the coastline of Argentina have been doing something that could be translated into English as some kind of the Atlantic Coast Rebellion. In Spanish, it's called Atlantic Castle. And the reason being that Shell, Equinor, and several other companies, Equinor is from Norway, uh, they are doing offshore drilling and seismic surveys, as you know, that are extremely damaging to the wildlife and so on. And people are really rebelling massively. And I've been thinking, and several have been thinking, shouldn't we really turn this into a global campaign against these companies? a global Atlantic Pacific campaign on the coastlines against the offshore operations, the, the seismic survey as you have done, but really come together. And like Elias was saying, what, what, how important that was during the apartheid that the global North also sabotaged Shell up here in Europe and beyond. We should also uh, call upon the global North movements to really tackle, there's also offshore operations in the global North uh, and in Europe and so on. So wouldn't it be great if we really came together globally because the oceans in a way divide us, but you can also look at it as they connect us and we could all fight the seismic, destructive seismic surveys and the offshore operations of these climate criminals. And this could also be a way to tackle Shell and to then tackle Equinor and the others. So just, I can leave that idea there. And if anyone is interested, you got my number on the chat. Maybe we can come together, start brainstorming uh, connect with the people in Argentina that are really fervent right now and see if we can put something together. You know, South America, Africa, we already have two big parts of the world and the global south coming together. That it wouldn't be too hard to mobilize people in Europe to support that, I hope. Thank you so much, Esteban. Um, and if you want to find his number, you might have to scroll up a little bit in the chat. <laughs> Uh, so maybe you want to post it again for people to get in touch. I think that's a really great opportunity. We did have uh, one question from Daniela. I'm seeing Tara is, also has a point. Is it okay, Tara, if we first take the question from Daniela and then you can also reply to that and make your own point. All right, Daniela. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for this very interesting panel. Um, I'm doing my PhD research on uh, political strategies and reactions of corporations to international campaigns, although more in agribusiness and minerals uh, than oil and gas. Um, but I'm curious uh, what the panelists think if um, this targeting directly of corporations, of course, it's bringing the space and this visibility of climate criminals. Um, but I'm also curious if it, uh, if you think there's a risk that it could lead to more self-regulations by the campaigns, right? And uh, sorry, by the corporations, and if there's this difficulty of translating victories in specific sites to others, when often they're based on voluntary agreements or falling back from the companies, and they're not entrenched in laws or state regulations, for example. So I think Peichi said that it's not a dichotomy. You have to target both the governments and the companies since they're so enmeshed. Um, but yeah, I'm curious what the other uh, panelists think of this, uh, the risks and the advantages of target, targeting corporations uh, directly and how that fits into this trend that already companies try to regulate themselves rather than 
being regulated. Thanks. Thank you, Daniela. I think that's a really important question, right? And I guess it goes back to how do we go from asking Shell to simply behave better to actually contributing to dismantling Shell? Um, all right. So um, first, uh, Tara wanted uh, to make a point, and maybe you can also share your thoughts on that. And then the other panelists feel free to share as well. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to pick up on the stuff around, uh, you know, what's happening with Shell in South Africa and, and Argentina. And I think that one of the things that's really important is uh, looking at, at, at different campaigns messaging and sharing messaging and sharing research. So I know that in South Africa, I've seen that there's been a lot of stuff around the harm that seismic testing does. There's been some really powerful research that's been shared, some interesting coverage. Um, local journalists have been talking about it and international journalists. And a lot of that stuff could be taken and superimposed, you know, amended and then applied to different parts of the world where Shell or other types of companies are doing that type of thing. So I think in terms of when we're campaigning and we're thinking about messaging, you know, it really helps to see what messaging has already been put out there, what's effective, and then adapting it to your local situation, you know, rather than having to kind of start from scratch and feeling quite overwhelmed sometimes about how to, to approach this type of stuff. Um, I think also when thinking about campaigning on this type of thing, you know, there's a whole kind of ecosystem of campaigning, you know, the stuff when somebody is actually getting out onto the streets, they're taking photographs, they're being present, that's really amazing, you know, taking that what's happening at the grassroots and then amplifying it out so that if you're sitting in a country halfway across the world, what can you do as activists to then draw attention to what's happening you know, at the ground in different parts of the world. So I think, you know, we all should, we all have a role to play and we all have a responsibility and we all have power to act as, um, as amplifiers and as news feeds, um, you know, to shine a spotlight on what's going on. So, so I think we're all empowered to do that. And I would really actively encourage us all thinking and taking responsibility for that. Thank you, Tara. I was also just thinking uh, with regards to um, the question, I mean, uh, I was thinking of Terence. You called your campaign "Shell to Sea" in Ireland, even though, as I understand, there was also another company involved. So, you know, with regards to the framing, what 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 made you make the campaign about Shell, and what kind of solidarity did you gain from that, or do you think it was maybe it should have been more directed at a government? I'm curious as to what you think about that. The mute button. I'm. You're audible now. I'm audible now. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Could you repeat that, Elias? I mean, there, there was a question about you know um, uh, the the targeting of Shell or individual comp companies specifically um, as a strategy. What you gain from that, or what the disadvantages could be. Yeah. So I'm curious as to how you went about that with the Shell to Sea campaign? Well, with the Shell to Sea campaign, we, uh, like I say, we initially shut down the site. Along with that, uh, activists around the country started at their local Shell or Statoil station, petrol station, picketing it for an hour or two hours. Uh, so that was an ongoing process right throughout the campaign for a lot of the campaign which eventually Shell sold all their petrol stations and Statoil. That's the, Statoil is now Equinor. So in that sense, it was very effective. It kept the issue uh, not just here in the Northwest Mayo, Northwest of Ireland, but it kept the issue alive around the country. Uh, and along with that, we had, uh, like I say, visitors from all over the world, from Ogoni, from uh, South Africa, lots of other places. Uh, and the international solidarity was, uh, it was a great help and a great boost to see that we weren't on our own. So going forward, whether it's with any campaign, the international solidarity, in my mind, uh, it matters a lot. So, yeah, but while the focus was on Shell and Statoil, they were the project operators. 
you need to get the pressure on the politicians as well, across politicians across the board. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I guess it's it's a really important point that I mean, one thing that um, targeting these companies specifically and naming them uh, allows is 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 to form international alliances because these because companies like Shell are so global, right? That although our differences with our experiences with Shell might differ, actually there's a lot of stuff that that is actually quite similar. I mean, we've been hearing about the the seismic um, testing and so on, but also about, you know, the hiring of mercenaries and, and so on. So I, I think that's a really good point. Um, I'm afraid uh, we're running out of time a little bit. And I know there's some people who wanted to ask more questions. Um, I see. I'm actually very sorry about that. Um, I think being mindful of everyone's time, uh, I think we should probably wrap up the conversation here. I'm sure that there'll be many, you know, WhatsApp groups and email lists coming out of this, hopefully. Also, we have three more events uh, uh, for this online conference. Uh, one more this afternoon. You can check it out online. It's all the same Zoom link and then two more tomorrow. So hopefully we can continue our conversation there. And I'm absolutely sorry if I didn't get uh, to, to your questions, um, uh, if you want, you can write them down as well and we can at least take them uh, into the conversation or if someone wants to stay afterwards, this of course also an opportunity, but for now let's maybe wrap up uh, this panel um, and maybe if all of the panelists um, want to share uh, something some ideas they got from this, want to react to something that was said, this is this is your chance. I think we can go through it in the original order again and start with Esteban. Sure, thank you. Again, it was an honor to be here. It's great to see you all and exchange ideas. And to the last question, I think this is a very important one to tackle. What do you do with the governments? Should, this is a, an important debate in the movements in Europe. There are some movements that tend to focus more on governments and don't want to focus on companies, and others that focus more on companies, like Ende Gelende, and are more reluctant to, to take action against governments or, or public institutions like that. But I see this as two sides of the same coin. And if we only tackle Shell, we'll be making a mistake without also addressing the governments, especially the governments of the global north, because we need to focus our energy on the people that have the real power, the centers of power, because Shell is a colonialist branch of a country and of economic interest in the Netherlands and, and the, in the UK. But also the UK and the Netherlands, they are a tool of Shell. It goes in both directions. So we need to tackle that side as well, in a, but in a coordinated fashion, when we have a strategy, which we don't have now, when we have a strategy, we'll find a rationale to explain why and where we should hit at the same time. And that would mean the operations of Shell, the political centers of power of Shell, the headquarters and so on, and also the political uh, powers of, of the global north and beyond that are responsible for regulating. I have the capacity to enforce laws or bring new laws into existence to prevent Shell from doing the offshore uh, seismic surveys or the fracking or the tar sands uh, exploitation and beyond. So the, the governments have a lot of power. Imagine a law in the UK that would ban or in, U, in the EU that would ban European companies from doing abroad the things they are banned from doing at home. That would kill a lot of the problems that are destroying the global south today, just with this kind of put your money where your mouth is kind of thing for Europe. And just like that, Europe could also ban the import of fracked gas from the front lines from the rest of the world. And that would be the end of fracking for a lot of places. So there is a lot of power in, in the governments if only we know how to pressure them. And we don't pressure them by calling to fight for 1.5. We don't pressure them by saying, tell the truth. They love that because you're asking for nothing. We pressure them by like telling us, give us a law banning the import of fried gas or ban the companies from doing crimes abroad that they cannot do at home. So thanks a lot for inviting me and I hope to see you again and on the streets. Thanks so much, Esteban. Um, next up is uh, Tara. 
Um, yeah, thanks. I think there were some really powerful points there. Um, in terms of thinking, I think one of the takeaways also is about, you know, when we're doing these campaigns, you know, mapping where are the pressure points. So maybe, you know, Shell won't listen, but who is, you know, Shell greenwashing with, you know, who are they, who are they sponsoring? And then you get to them by naming and shaming them. You know, they they want to use their money to, to greenwash and they try to get into bed with different things. So whether it's the Science Museum or whether it's, you know, sponsoring, you know, degree programs in Singapore or whatever it is. And I think it's like looking in, you know, who, who are making those decisions? So if it's a university in Singapore, you know, which who within that university, which senior management team or which individuals are making those decisions to to have partnerships with Shell? If it's the Science Museum, you know, the Science Museum campaign has been really effective and Basically, it's a bit of a, a gift, actually, that Shell is sponsoring the Science Museum because it's a, sort of a Trojan horse in which we can, as activists, really highlight the sorts of nefarious activities that Shell gets up to. So I think in terms of wherever we're campaigning, looking for those those pressure points, looking for those opportunities. You know, I know in South Africa, there was the, the government minister who's in bed with Shell and he's had a lot of public flack around it. So that's another example. But, um, so that's what I would also encourage when you guys are thinking about your campaigning and your networking. Thank you, Tara. This made me think that last AGM, actually, the Shell, I think, CEO or one of the top Shell bosses was reporting that his his 13 year old kid is now really angry at him for working for Shell. So if the naming and shaming arrives in the families of those people who run Shell, then, you know, they might feel the pressure in a, in a very different way. Um, Friday, you're next. Right, Friday, are you here? If not, I'll call upon you in a bit. Um, and then Peachy is next. So I, I often get asked by, you know, just ordinary people on the streets, by government officials, um, even by, you know, university professors like, Oh, you know, what, what do you expect us to do? You know, if we don't have all companies, what, what do you expect us to do? How are we going to have jobs, how we and, and should we not be working with these companies instead of shutting them down. So I think what we need to be really vigilant about, about um, is the fact that the messaging is now turning to, you know, the role that companies are playing in sustainability, um, and how states, uh, how governments and countries can need, need to now uh, compete to capture opportunities in the green economy. I mean, this is just green capitalism in, in a different guise. So um, in November 22, November 2021, Shell actually opened a plastic waste to chemical feedstock plant in Singapore. Uh, again, another big speech by the chairman of Shell Singapore um, saying that, yes, yes, we recognize the climate crisis, etc. So I think um, it's very important to, to highlight the fact that there are still um, things going on in parts of the world, like um, um, off the coast of Argentina, off the coast of, of, um, of Nigeria, of, uh, sorry, of South Africa, um, that they're still prospecting um, for extraction, you know, and this is the same company. So, you know, uh, we know that recycling is just an alibi for, for uh, companies to, to justify the continued, um, their continued existence um it's you know plastics um is a way plastics is what uh, these companies are relying on to project their future growth um it's very important to 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 then uh continue amplifying and putting these events of you know seismic exploration and yet <laughs> recycling plant these are not consistent with the same world you know and, and continue highlighting these um events that are still happening thank you Peggy. uh and then Next for the wrap up is uh, Terence. Uh, I'm not sure, am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Okay. Yeah. Uh, like the last speaker said there, uh, like the like Shell with their uh, plastic recycling. Uh, the recycling and all that is good, but it's simply uh, keeping Shell in the power. Shell or whatever oil companies it may be, uh, with their various uh, schemes, whether it's plastics recycling, carbon capture, is keeping them basically as the rulers. And uh, like one of the previous speakers there spoke about uh, what's happening in the global south. And it's a direct result of here in the so-called uh, developed world. 
that the global south is suffering and has suffered as it is, like Nigeria, South Africa, various places. Uh, so you might say that uh, us here in the so-called developed West or whatever you may call it, North, uh, we are the virus of various nationals, uh, national governments. We are the virus on the rest of the world because uh, it's as a result of development here now that uh, they're targeting and they probably will target it more the South. So uh, we need as much uh, global solidarity as possible. And Thank you, Terence. Uh, I seen someone there on the thing before, Magella, Sister Magella McCarran. She worked with uh, the Goni Nine and Kinsar Weaver in Nigeria. She was there for years. Uh, uh, she lived there for years. So maybe what's why it's so hard. Thank you, Terence. And this is a good segue to our last wrap up, uh, which is um, Friday. Do you have a Do you have a few yeah. last words? Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me just add a few things again. Uh, strategically, we uh, discuss what we can do. But like one of the speakers say, there is a link, a synergies between the share and the uh, government. Again, I don't want to make it so vast because if you really want to achieve something, you need to have a specific objective. You need to have a specific objective. So my own target basically is on the share. I know we have other oil companies who are contributing to the issue program, but if we address them by one by one, I think the other people, they will get fear. And the fear will make them to run away from the fossil fuel industry and they will swing over to renewable energy. Again, I will also add to all of us who are here today that it's also necessary and very significant to start advocating for renewable energy. Because for you to close down an oil company, or for us to make sure oil company have been closed down, there must be something we really need to replace for them. And that is an alternative for them. It's still on power generation. So we need to train and advocate for enable energy and ensure that the local people are being uh, accessible, get accessible to it. That is, the, the neighborhood energy should be affordable for a common citizen to afford to get it. Then all these things we are talking about fossil fuel, the, the demand for it will gradually and drastically reduce. If common man can access renewable energy, the solar panel, uh, much of them, you make it, making use of it in the house, then the demand of fossil fuel, the demands of petrol, the demands of fuel, the demand of oil and gas will drastically reduce in our region or in the global world. So we have to keep uh, advocating for uh, uh, renewable energy. In a much uh, we are building a solidarity movement and joining each other in demanding for justice in each part of the world. Then again, we shouldn't fail on policy because one of the key or one of the strong area we need to consider is, is politics. That politics, the politician, they are the people who are at, at the base of uh, approving a policy. And for a policy, a bill to be passed, we need our people to be there. That is simple truth. We need people who have the conscious minds of the environment. People who, have, who, who, who look down on the profit making and looking down center of the hearts of, the, of, the, of everybody. So if we have those kind of people in government, then we believe that sometimes things will change. So that would just be my summit on this thing for now. Thank you, Friday. Another, another call for international solidarity. Um, thank you all so much for sharing. I think um, it's, really, it's really cool to get people in one room from so many uh, different places um, and 
trying to start thinking about how we can how we can work together and i really hope this is just the start of a of a very um very interesting year of resistance to shell and of course the entire fossil fuel industry uh, i just want to thank everyone for attending i think there are some great questions so good to see people from so many different places here um, i hope we all stay in touch there's also the next event is already starting in about 23 minutes and for everyone who's now really curious about thinking more about strategy um, this will be a very interesting one because it's a workshop um, by future beyond shell who have been thinking a lot about you know what kind of strategies are the exact right ones what kind of demands can we rally around should we tax shell should we dismantle them should we you know break them up um what 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 are the right methods to to go there and so on so if you are curious to think more about that i think um that that will be your opportunity and of course tomorrow there are more events as well there's an event on uh, nigeria um specifically and the the one of the biggest bribery cases ever in the oil industry where shell and the italian oil company any have been paying like billions of dollars of bribes uh, as well as a uh, youth panel with some really, really cool activists um, from the broader sort of Fridays for Future movement, which will also be really, really interesting to watch. Um, so without further ado, we're eight minutes over time, but not too much. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, if, you're, um, uh, if you need to leave now, feel free to do so. Um, otherwise, I think, Casey, we're having... Uh, for those who, who want to join, we're having just a little solidarity photo shoot. Um, Casey, do you want to maybe explain what this is about? And for everyone yeah, who I, wants I, to... I want to give a chance for a minute or so for everyone who wants to leave to leave. Um, we wanted to do a quick uh, solidarity thing for comrades in the Netherlands, um, for the little forest that's going to be cut down um, and some strong activists who want to occupy it. Um, but um, yeah, feel free to exit and thank you so much again to, to everyone who asked questions and listened and donated your time. I'm, I feel very honored. I'm blushing a bit. It's very, yeah, I feel very honored to be part of it. Um, but yeah, if you want to join, uh, I'm going to put the, the hashtag in the chat and maybe you can find a, a paper um, and a pen and write that down and hold it in the camera and I'll take a quick screenshot. Do you, do you want to tell us what this is about more specifically? Yes, so, uh, sorry, let me... Um, yeah, so this is about uh, a, a forest, like, I mean, the Netherlands, we're always struggling to find, or like much of the nature has already been destroyed here, but this is one of the few kind of older growth forests. Um, more than 200 years old, really dense, a lot of uh, uh, bats and badgers there. Um, and they want to cut it down to expand the car factory from the company Netcar. Um, there already is a factory. There's not really a need for this uh, forest to be cut down. This is just in case they at some point get bigger uh, contracts from maybe some bigger car um, company like BMW or, or something. So. Um, yeah, they are having a demo today, so some of the other comrades from Chalmers Paul are there on the ground to support them. And we thought it would be nice also to do something here, but no pressure at all. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, all right, so, so we're yeah, taking a picture with this to... hashtag and mm -hmm. we're going to hold it up, and you're going to take the picture, right? Uh, yes, I can do that. Then I can't hold anything myself. <laughs> uh, just briefly, because there's a question about the recording for people who maybe came late or, you know, missed some parts of the meeting or went to share it with friends. We did a recording um, and uh, we're going to check back with all the panelists about, you know, if it is fine sharing and if it, if it is, then we'll, we'll be happy to share the recording as well at some later point.